Welcome. This is video lecture on chapter 19, Quantitative Traits and their Analysis. Just under half the information in this chapter is beyond the scope of this course, so those slides have been grayed out. We learned with Mendelian genetics that there are discrete buckets into which phenotypes can fall based on genotypes. And indeed, Mendel was instrumental in choosing characteristics that he knew had discrete outcomes before he conducted his experiments. In genetics, variation of that type is called discontinuous. It's like a bar chart. If you have strawberry ice cream or you have chocolate ice cream, you can either buy one or the other. There's nothing in between. The 3 to 1 ratios in the F2 that Mendel obtained, beginning with pure breeding parents, is an example of discontinuous trait variation. What else exists in the natural world? And the answer is that genes fall into two other containers. One is a polygenic system, and the second is a multifactorial traits system. And both of these show continuous variation with a range of values. This would be equivalent to exam scores going from 0% to 100% with fractions of decimals. The classic example is human height. If you take the population of the campus and you measure people's height, they will fall into a continuous spectrum of variation. And human height is now known to be a multifactorial trait. Human height is influenced by multiple genes. And those genes are interacting with other factors such as developmental biology and environmental parameters such as the nutritional state of the individual. Height is a great example because if nutrition early on in childhood is not adequate or there are developmental issues in the womb and thereafter, then the person may not meet their genetic potential for height as dictated by their gene allele combination. Traits often creature that are under polygenic multiple gene control also show continuous variation and the results suggest that within many of these systems there's a demarcation between some genes that have major effects on the characteristic and other genes that may tweak those effects. The major genes are called major genes and the minor genes are called modifier genes because they simply modify what the major genes have instilled. With some polygenic traits with continuous distribution of phenotypes, the results are the additive nature of multiple additive genes and their alleles. So this relationship may be so that scientists are able to assign different values to the alleles so therefore, depending on the combination of alleles at each of these genes, one can predict the outcome of that characteristic. But we have to be careful. For certain traits, these genes have an equal value. For others, some genes have a greater value than others, and so do their alleles. These observations were made in the early 1900s by scientists. So our understanding of quantitative traits has been around for a while now. Particular credit goes to a scientist named Nielsen Eel, who performed genetic analysis on wheat and the color of their kernels. In those experiments, the color of the kernel ranged from dark red to white, and it appeared to be influenced by the alleles of two genes. The genes were called A and B. The number one alleles of both genes, A1 and B1, they conferred color on the kernel in equivalent amounts. Therefore, he attributed a unit of one to each of those alleles. However, the other alleles at each locus, A2 and B2, they were also equivalent to each other, but neither added any color. So he awarded those alleles zero points each. By looking at the genotype of any individual, 
because these are diploid organisms, you can calculate the number of number one alleles and therefore get a mathematical relationship between the polygenic situation. Figure 19.1 should not be daunting. If you follow it carefully, it makes full sense. Let's start with the parents. So the parents that were bred were dark red kerneled with white kernel. So this was the darkest kernel available, and this was the whitest kernel available. So naturally, the genotype of this should be at the A locus, homozygous A1, and at the B locus, homozygous B1. So that gives us four units of color. However, the white kernel on the white parent should be homozygous twos for both alleles. That gives us no color. So there's an, a score of zero. When the gametes are made, the gametes here will be A1, B1, and the gametes over here will be A2, B2. And those gametes will come together in Mendelian fashion, and they'll generate pink kernels. So this is an example of partial dominance. And we can understand why, because these children will have exactly the same score of two. One coming from the A1 allele and the second one coming from the B1 allele. So a score of two each. And if these two are then interbred, then we end up with this Punnett square with 16 boxes. And we can then calculate the value of each of these genetic combinations. And we end up getting the summary of the genotypes and the phenotypes. Believe it or not, the number of phenotypes is five. So a score of zero, a score of one, a score of two, a score of three, and a maximum score of four. With that particular example, the mathematics works out perfectly in relationship to the multiple alleles across the two genes. People soon realized there was a mathematical relationship in this case too. So when you have three genes, then the outcome of the F2 after breeding pure parents was seven classes, seven phenotypic classes, which is beautifully illustrated in figure 19.2. Take your time, look at these three genes, A, B, and C, with two alleles each, with a score of one for the number one allele and a score of zero for the number two allele. These are the F1, breed the F1 together, you end up with this Punnett square, and from this Punnett square, you can see these nice patterns of color, and they translate into this histogram. There are seven categories in the histogram. Therefore, for multiple additive genes, which is a category, the mathematics comes down to this formula here, 2n plus 1, where n is the number of genes involved in that particular phenotypic variation. So the reason we got seven in the previous example using this formula is because we had three genes, each with two alleles, then we added one and that gave us seven. So two times three is six plus one equals seven. Just to prove the point and to show you a trend, look at these histograms. At the top we have one gene, then we have two genes, three, four, five you'll see that the mathematics from this equation is still valid all the way down. But the other thing is, we're beginning to see a shape developing in our histogram. So this bell-shaped shape indicates that there's a mathematical relationship between these genes. Another pattern that emerges is the proportion of these extreme phenotypes in relation to the total. So here we can see they represent a fair proportion, 50% of the total progeny. But down here and here, they represent a small fraction. And if we table that data, we find this relationship. So the number of genes and the extreme phenotypes begins to dramatically decline as the number of genes increases. But the number of phenotypic categories begins to climb in a more arithmetic fashion. In another experiment, on quantitative trait production. Um, Edward East in 1916 published data 
revealing that there was a relationship between the length of the corolla. The corolla is this region here for these flowers, from the sepals to the tip of the petals. He mated two pure breeding lines, one with a short corolla and the other with a longer corolla. And the F1 offspring had a corolla intermediate between the two parents. And we can see that data here. So this is the F1. What he did next was to allow the F1 plants to self-fertilize. And he obtained 450 F2 plants. And he measured the size of the corolla in those F2s and made a graph. And the graph is indicated right here. And then he spent three additional generations with these plants trying to regenerate the size of the original short and long corollas. So this represents a few generations. And he was trying to get back to the size of these. And eventually he was able to get close. From this research he came up with two important conclusions. The first, that the length of the corolla in these plants is controlled by multiple alleles of multiple genes. The second, perhaps more importantly, was that the phenotypic expression of the length of the corolla was partially explainable by variation within the genes, but also had something to do with environmental factors. This is very obvious when you look at the data for the parents. So even the short corolla parents, they fell into a range, as did the long pure breeding corolla parents. The most fundamental question then is how much of a feature is controlled by the genes and how much is controlled by the environment. And this is an important question, although it's very difficult to scientifically divide into those two categories or any particular trait. At one end of this continuum, the situation is pretty simple. So when there's no environmental interaction with the genes, the phenotype of the organism corresponds directly to the alleles and the genes and their genotype. As the environmental component begins to interact with these genes, then we see a wider range of phenotypic values for the same genotypes. So the spread effect comes into play. We'll look at this in a second. Therefore, at this end of the spectrum, where there's no environmental interaction, for this gene with two alleles, we see that there are discrete phenotypic classes. And the parents here and the offspring, the grandchildren here, fall into the same phenotypic category. When you have a small amount of interaction between the genes and the environment, then the data begins to blend out. So instead of being a discrete line, you start seeing this distribution with the averages in the middle and then you have extremes. The same thing is seen in the offspring and in the F2. But there are also cases, and in most this is the situation, uh, where the environment has a bigger say in the outcome, the phenotype. And therefore, there's a spreading effect. And in this case, it's maybe hard to tell the difference between the heterozygote and this homozygote. In these situations, there may be a huge continuous variation in the phenotype caused by the genes. But the phenotype can still be divided into two or three distinct categories. And in those particular cases, in those particular cases, we use the word threshold traits. These are threshold traits. And they normally have a medical correlation with people being either affected with the condition or unaffected. If you're below the threshold value, you will not have the disease. If you're over the threshold value, then you will have the disease. And the graphical representation is given here. So this is the threshold, this dotted line. This is the average, but this is the threshold. Anybody with a genetic liability above this value will normally have the disease. Anybody below will not have the disease. So that's an important term in itself, genetic liability. We're going to look at that next. 
What is genetic liability? It's a term for the organism's risk of having the affected phenotype. So the bottom scale here is genetic liability. So once you approach this end of the spectrum, your genetic liability, the chance of having the disease, of course, increases. Whereas if you're down here, there's a very, very remote probability that you will have the condition. With most of these disease conditions, the majority of the population will lie below the threshold of genetic liability. There may be exceptions to this rule that we'll find in the future. Another observation is that for both polygenic and threshold traits, first-degree relatives of an affected person are more likely to be affected than an average person in the population. And that's because of the process of shared genetic liability. This last fact is illustrated in figure 19.7. In the top cross, we have a two liability alleles in this individual, and then we have three liability alleles in this individual. And when they're mated, the progeny that they produce will have the following profile. And you can see here that the threshold of liability in this particular case is given by this dotted line. One in 32 of their offspring are beyond the threshold and therefore will have the affliction. In the second example, the two parents have a 3-3 liability. When they produce their offspring, in this case, the odds of some of their progeny having the affliction increases to 7 out of 64. Non-genetic factors the two that we spoke about earlier, the environment and developmental factors, can have an important smearing effect, especially near the threshold. So, so somebody could have a genetic liability here, but the environment could smear them across the threshold and have them afflicted by the condition. Another individual with the same genetic liability in a different environment may find themselves being smeared the other way, therefore not being afflicted. This is a most important concept in genetics. Students should keep this in mind whenever they consider why someone in their community has some disease and somebody else does not. The second section of the chapter simply expands on what we've been saying all along that mathematics and genetics can go hand in hand in the vast majority of cases. That applies to the traits considered in this chapter. Quantitative trait analysis is basically statistics. So in 1918, Fisher is credited with using statistical analysis to show that quantitative traits and the result of segregation of alleles at multiple genes is an additive effect. He was able to show the converse. By looking at the offspring and counting them, you could then get an idea of how the genes were interacting. By the way, is this not what Mendel did in his simple experiments? Because of the smearing effect Fisher observed in his data, he was able to make conclusions that environmental factors contributed to the continuous variation in the populations. Fisher is accredited as being the father of quantitative genetics. Over the next few slides, we're going to go through and apply some very simple statistical analysis tools to some quantitative genetic data. Let's start at the first step, which is to measure the phenotypic variation in our population. We'll begin with height in humans. In this particular population, in table 198a, we have the frequency distribution of height in 1,000 college-aged males. The scientists decided what size of each of these bins was. So here we have 155 centimeters to 157, a range of 2 centimeters. So each of these bins is 2 centimeters in depth. The 1,000 males 
fall into these bins according to these numbers. Then mathematically the frequency is simply this number divided by that number as a percentage. So 0.4% of the population is in this bin out of the thousand. And here we can see 18.8% of the population has a height that falls into 173 to 175 centimeters. In figure 19.8b we have males and females and their height is given in discrete buckets or bins called inches. So we're going from centimeters now to inches. It doesn't matter, this is a separate set of data. The important thing is we can see that there are other statistical labels applied to this data. So we have something known as an average, we have something called the standard deviation, S, and we have something called the variance, S squared. And these are very important statistics that allow us to determine the profile for this type of population. The next few slides simply convey the meaning of each one of those categories. So the average, also known as the mean, is a value that can be calculated easily by taking all the values, all the values here, and then dividing by the total number of individuals, which in the case of the females was 68, and for the male data, it's going to be 70. Therefore, the average is 64.5 inches for the females and 70.2 inches for the males. Incidentally, two other statistical measures, starting with the letter M, are mode and median. They are not able to be substituted in for the mean. The mean is separate. The median value is the middle value in the data. The mode is the most common value in the data. So going back to our data, for the females, we can see the mode would be 12. For the males, the mode would be 10, i.e. 72 and 66. Once the simple measure of the mean has been calculated, then the variance can be determined using this formula here. Don't be put off. This is a pretty simple mathematical relationship, the wording of which is relayed right here. So I'll read through this with you. So the variance of a data set is the sum of the square, the sum of the square of the difference between each individual value minus the mean. Then dividing that by the degrees of freedom, that is the number of independent variables. What significance does the variance have for us? The next figure shows us that these three populations all have the same mean. But you can see that the distribution around the mean is different. Here the data is very tight around the mean. Here the data is very loose. So this could be three populations of males around the world in different countries where they all have the same mean height, say six foot. But in this country, all the males are very close to six foot. Whereas in this country, they can range from five feet to seven feet in this spread. So the variance tells us what this shape looks like around the mean. The variance can be stated mathematically by something known as the standard deviation. It's simply taking the square root of the variance and you can calculate the standard deviation. So it's basically how far from the mean the data is spread in a mathematical way rather than looking at it in a graphical way. The next section goes a little bit deeper into understanding the phenotypic variance. What's responsible for the phenotypic variance? We well, just told you that in the vast majority of cases, it's going to be the genotype interacting with the environment. In a few exceptions, it's just going to be the genotype. But we're not looking at that now. We're looking at the first case. 
using abbreviations, phenotypic variance is going to be now labeled with V small p. Phenotypic variance can be divided into two components, the genetic variance, Vg, and the environmental variance, Ve. So the genetic variance is a proportion of the phenotypic variance due to genotype differences. This is very important. The genetic variance component, Vg, is due to genotype differences. Not the genes themselves, but the genotype differences. One way to relate to this concept is to consider highly inbred populations, which we can make in laboratories, where all the individuals are homozygous for the alleles controlling that particular trait. Therefore, the difference in the genotypes is zero. So VG is zero. So it's an important, very important concept that must be understood at this point. Otherwise, you may get lost in subsequent slides. We're not looking at the contribution of the genes. We're looking at the difference between individuals in their genotypes. Likewise, the environmental variance is the proportion of the genetic variance that is due to changes in the environment inhabited by those individuals. In experiments in the lab where the environment is carefully controlled, if all the creatures are living in the exact same environmental parameters, then VE, the difference in the environment experienced by the individuals, will be zero. But this can only happen in the lab. And in nature, there are never or very rarely two circumstances in which two individuals are in the same environment. The classic example that comes to mind is identical twins inside the womb. We used to think that the two twins were in the same exact environment, i.e. the mother's womb. But it now appears that the position of the twins in the womb is environmentally different. One twin may be closer to a blood supply than the other, or one twin may be positioned in a way that it gets an advantage over the other twin. Because the environment is unlikely to be the same, we can work on conditions where the genetics are the same. So pure inbred lines of individuals are genetically uniform or the same. And in those cases, the phenotypic variance is equal to the environmental variance because there's no genetic variance. Therefore, therefore, if these pure breeding parental lines are crossed, mated with each other, then the F1 will be heterozygous, but again, they are all heterozygous. So that phenotypic variation is once more entirely due to the environment. When these F1 are crossed to each other to produce the F2, now for the first time, we'll get segregation of alleles. And offspring with different genotypes will exist in the population. In this case, the genetic component, the variation due to the genotype, is a factor. So VP now breaks up into not just VE, but also now VG. Figure 1910 illustrates this relationship. Here is one parent line, here's the other. And the reason they're not discrete is because the blurring effect of the environment. This is the F1. Again, genetically they will be discrete, but that genotype is blurred because of the environment. But the F2 will have both the blurring effect of the environment and also the genotypes are different. Hang on a second, there's more, there's more. The genetic variance, VG, can be further segregated into three sub-buckets. The first one is known as additive variance, VA. The second is dominance variance, VD. 
and the third is interactive variance VI. What is each one? Well, the additive variance derives from the added effects of all the alleles contributing to that trait. We saw that earlier with the A1 and the A2, the B1 and the B2. The dominance variance, VD, results from dominance relationships in which the heterozygous individuals are not intermediate between the two homozygous states. We saw this in an earlier chapter in the textbook. And the last one is the interactive variance. That's derived from the interactions between genes and their alleles. This is the epistasis interactions that we learnt about again in a different chapter. It seems we're coming around full circle to understanding why different genetic relationships have to be learnt so we can understand the depth of interaction that takes place in the natural world. Section 19.3 tackles the genetic term heritability. Heritability is a pretty abstract thing, but still it's something that can be understood. Because heritability differs from trait to trait, it's a very important parameter for breeding companies and breeders such as farmers to understand. It tells them how much of the variation in their population of creatures is attributable to genetic variation. Therefore it tells them the scope in which they can move the desired trait, i.e. milk production, in that particular population through artificial breeding programs, etc. Heritability has a mathematical value attached to it, and that is a measure of the proportion of the phenotypic variation that is due to the genetic variation. So VP equals VG. How much of the VG is contributing to the VP? A large heritability value indicates that a large proportion of the variation in the phenotype is due to genetic interactions. And therefore, it, those can be manipulated to a larger degree. A low heritability value means that it's the environment that's controlling the spread of the phenotype and therefore less of a genetic role is played. Heritability itself can be broken into two parts. The broad sense heritability with a capital H and the narrow sense heritability with a lowercase h. The broad sense heritability is a measure or an estimate of the proportion of the phenotypic variation VP that is due to total genetic variation VG. And if we go back to this slide, recall that we said that VG included VA, VD, and VI, whereas narrow sense heritability is only concerned with one of those three, which is the additive genetic variation, that is VA. VA. So it ignores VD and VI. The formula is the narrow sense heritability is equal to VA divided by VP, whereas in this case the broad sense heritability is equal to VG divided by VP. Both of these are expressed as proportions and they range in magnitude from 0.0, .0 to 1.0. There's lots of confusion among students as to the true meaning of heritability. So misunderstandings have to be clarified right now at the onset of your learning. There are four attributes of heritability that are central to its true meaning. Let's go through them and then see how we re-establish our relationship with heritability. So the first of those attributes is that heritability is a measure of the degree to which genetic differences contribute to phenotypic variation in the trait. Now these genetic differences of that particular population 
is what that component is concerned with. But it's not the same thing as saying the genotype. The genotype of a population may be unique to that population and different to another population. Indeed, these heritability values can change if the same population is moved to a different environment. So you have a bunch of cows feeding on one field with one type of grass, and then you move the same cows onto a different field with a different type of grass. The heritability in terms of milk production can change. There's also a temporal component, a time component. So if cows are feeding on grass and producing milk in one field at one time, then in a different season, the same cows feeding on the same grass on, in the same field may have a different heritability. A high heritability value does not eliminate environmental factors. Even heritability at 100% doesn't preclude environmental influences totally. With broad sense heritability, big H squared, one has a general measure of the size of the genetic influence over the phenotype that's been studied. Broad sense heritability is okay when one does not know the genetic components and how to partition them. In a classic experiment, Wilkins in 1988 measured broad sense heritability in a population of fish. The fish existed in a cave and he measured the evolution of their eye tissue. He crossed blind cave fish with sighted cave fish and he measured the eye tissue mean and then the variation in both the parents, the F1 and the F2. And the data that he obtained are given on this slide. The F1 fish, the hybrids between the blind and the sighted cave fish, were uniformly heterozygous. So all the variance observed was due to environmental factors. And he measured that as being 0 0.057 centimeters squared. Remember, this is a variance. In the grandchildren, the F2, the phenotypic variance was measured across that population, and that was found to be 0.563 centimeters cubed. Therefore, rearranging our equation, where we can eliminate from VP the VE value that we got earlier, we end up with the VG. So VP is this number, VE is that number, so take this number away from that number, and what you're left with is VG. In this case, VG was 0 0.506. The heritability, the broad sense heritability, is this ratio. It's VG, this value, divided by VP, this value. And you can see that relationship. And then you end up with the broad sense heritability of 0.899. 90%. Twin studies in humans help us understand the same phenomena, how much of our phenotype variation is due to both genetic and environmental factors. Heritability in humans is pretty difficult to measure accurately, but these twin studies help us understand and obtain values. There are two types of twins maternal twins and fraternal twins. Maternal twins are known as identical twins, also known as monozygotic twins. Because they come from the same sperm and egg union, that particular oocyte, they are going to share all their genes, guaranteed. So for monozygotic twins, there is no genetic variance. So their phenotypic variance is equal to their environmental variance. Fraternal twins are born of two separate eggs and two separate sperm, and they therefore share 50% of their alleles. So we can rewrite the equation as such, where we now know that in these particular twins, 
the VEG factor is half. With these two starting points, we can go on to do some sophisticated analysis, and we end up by understanding the relationship between different traits and their heritability. So the number of fingerprint ridge counts in humans has a 90% heritability component, whereas longevity, how long you live, is only 30%. Likewise, verbal ability has a 65% genetic component, and mathematical aptitude only has a 30% genetic component. Interesting. There are some cautions when making estimates of heritability. These sources of error can lead to inaccuracies, especially in increasing the heritability values. A deeper investigation of identical twins leads to some other observations, those of concordance and discordance. In these studies, a large number of identical twins, those that have lived together since birth, and those that have lived in different regions of the world since birth, are compared. By studying different traits, one can determine the level of similarity between these twin pairs. So concordance is the term used when both have the same phenotype for a particular trait. Discordance is the term used when the two twins have a dissimilar phenotype. From this, we can make the following conclusion. If phenotype is 100% genetically determined, then concordance would be 100% in monozygotic twins. They should have 100% the same phenotype. So any variation in phenotype between these twins tells us that there may be a environmental factor in play. Table 19.3 shows us this data. Let's look at the most profound findings. So which hand do you use? Are you left-handed or right-handed? Well, this appears to be present at the same level in both monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins. So it's unlikely to have a strong genetic component. Whereas something like epilepsy is more prevalent in monozygotic twins than dizygotic twins. That suggests a more genetic influence over this particular trait. Likewise, rheumatoid arthritis has a higher value in monozygotic compared to dizygotic twins. Although heritability is useful for farmers, they particularly like narrow sense heritability. That's what they're really interested in. By manipulating the alleles of additive genes, they're able to move their population towards a greater outcome, i.e. milk production. In that respect, we come up with another mathematical parameter called the selection differential, big S. This is simply the difference between the mean of the whole population, the entire herd, and those individuals that are going to be bred, the breeding population. It turns out that milk production has a lower heritability than body weight for cattle. So farmers are more likely to change the body weight of their herd by appropriate breeding than they are to change milk production. The rest of this table has some interesting outcomes too. Following breeding, one can measure the response to selection, which is big R. So that depends on the extent to which the difference between the population mean and the mean of the mating individuals can be passed on to the progeny. So big R is equal to big S times narrow sense heritability. Rearranging this equation, we end up with narrow sense heritability can also be estimated by dividing R, big R, by big S. The response to selection divided by the selection differential. This 
type of heritability estimate has more practical applications for plant and animal breeders and evolutionary biologists. So your farmer probably has this knowledge. From the lesson so far, one could interpret the following conclusion, that in terms of selection, selection response is expected to be the greatest when narrow sense heritability is equal to one. These selective pressures operating on populations over many generations reminds us that this is evolution. And we'll see this again in a different context when we study evolution in the evolution chapter. But we will understand that there are three possible modes of action which affect the mean and the variance of these populations over time. There's directional selection in which the mean phenotypic value is shifted in one direction because selection favors that particular end of the distribution. And that leads to a narrowing of both the phenotypic range and the variance in the population. Figure 1911a illustrates this nicely. So in this column, the heritability, the narrow sense heritability is zero. And it doesn't matter how hard one tries, the mean of the population stays where it is over a couple of generations. In this case, narrow sense heritability is 20%, and we see a shift between what's selected for, and these are the matings, and this is the population mean. We get a shift towards one end of the spectrum. And then this last case, we have 100% heritability, and we have the same mating pressures, but we see a greater response to the mating program. The S value that we see is the selection differential between the population mean and the mating mean. There are two other possible outcomes to selective environmental pressures. The second is stabilizing selection. That favors the intermediate phenotype and the extremes are reduced, therefore also narrowing down the variance in the phenotype. And the last one is disruptive selection. And in this case, the phenotypes at the extremes are both favored, and the intermediate phenotypes are unfavored. In this last example of disruptive selection, the phenotypic variance is increased, and the phenotypic split may occur within the population, leading to the potential or speciation. That's something that we'll take up in another chapter. Comparing the phenotypic distribution of the parents and the offspring, we see that the three types of selection can lead to three changes. The first column is directional selection, and we saw that example here. The middle column is stabilizing selection, we see a narrowing on both extremes so that the mean is favored. And in disruptive selection, we have a narrowing in the center because each extreme is being favored. Keep an eye on this, please, for another chapter. The last section of the chapter, 19.4, goes into QTLs, quantitative trait loci. It's been determined that we do not need to understand these at this time. Therefore, if you wish, you may go through these slides and determine for yourself if you have a good understanding, but you shall not be tested on these slides on any examination in this course. I thank you for listening, and we wish you a good understanding. Thank you.